Uh, welcome to the Open Net Monitor uh, Science uh, Webinar Series. Um, today we uh, we have a special series uh, which will uh, uh, provide a launch of uh, a new app uh, developed inside our project, and which is also going to include a little demo. Um, and uh, but before that, we want to introduce a bit to the project and tell you what is uh, this Open Net Monitor project about, and uh, why and how we designed this app. Uh, so we are uh, a Horizon Euro project. Uh, we started in June 2022, so now a bit longer than one year running. Um, and uh, it's a relatively large uh, project with uh, uh, 23 partner, almost 110 people, uh, as far as I know, working on the project. Um, in a way, the project meetings are a little conferences, uh, as you can imagine. Um, and you can, of course, read about this project on the CORDIS, uh, European Commission's CORDIS uh, system. Um, and these are just the logos of the uh, participants uh, in this project. Uh, we are a European project, so everybody is uh, European, but you see there's a mixture of uh, universities, research institutions, uh, startups, uh, SMEs, um, and um, also some non-for-profit organizations or governmental organizations. Uh, the project is led by OpenGeoHub. Uh, I'm, by the way, director at OpenGeoHub, so uh, I am also the principal investigator on the project. Uh, we have recently published our uh, implementation plan, so it's publicly available. We try to be as much as transparent as possible. Uh, from this uh, link here provided, you can access that um, implementation plan. Uh, in a nutshell, the uh, project has uh, eight uh, work packages, uh, from which four work packages are production work packages. So there are the work package three, four, five, and six. Uh, one work package is focused on uh, development on backend and frontend uh, software mainly. Uh, then one package is uh, focused work package for uh, development of the in situ data, so training data sets. And then work package five and six uh, deliver a, a suite of tools to support EU and global programs. Uh, we recently had a, a global workshop at the uh, URAC in Bolzano, uh, and I'm very happy we have video recorded all the talks. So if you really want to know what this project is about, I actually recommend watching our uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, OpenGeoHub. You can uh, watch all the videos, even some of this data set you will see in these presentations. They all explain in detail in this uh, list of the talks. Some of the talks are over one hour long because they include also very detailed demonstrations. Um, so what, what the title of the project is Open Earth Monitor, but what exactly is an Earth Monitor? Uh, there's something uh, it's good to, to try to define at the beginning. Uh, so let's say we try to define a monitor as a, a back and front end solution. Um, usually it's a web GIS uh, based uh, but solution that um, provides uh, uh, current and um, um, uh, past information of the states of environment. Um, and and we're talking about, of course, the um, uh, states of environment and events, which uh, we consider especially important for human life and for the quality of uh, um, uh, citizens, and but also living beings in general. Uh, usually the roles of a monitor is to uh, help raise awareness, to warn citizens, uh, then also to uh, provide most up-to-date information uh, through some dashboard, uh, to serve as an objective basis, uh, and then some monitors generate data, and this data is then um, eventually used by the statistical offices to register and archive events. Uh, we are happy that we live in a time where uh, the world is now um, mapped uh, using earth observation technology or the remote sensing technology. And we are happy that we live in that time because this has become really like a relatively objective way to, to uh, track environment. So it's a less and less controversial, uh, less and less it's a question of interpretation, but it's just a, a question of getting the right data and um, uh, believing uh, satellite images that we get from the earth. In a way, the satellite images don't lie. These are some examples of monitors uh, built by different organizations, whether governmental or um, uh, NGOs or private. Um, and also you see monitors also sometimes there's a synonym for monitor. 
uh, for example, a, a track or a tracing tool, tracking tool, watch, emergency tool. These are all synonyms for a monitor. Uh, and you can see that uh, they can be focused on really different teams. So there's the Global Forest Watch, there's the uh, Copernicus Emergency Management System, Forest Fire Information System, Air Pollution Monitoring. Uh, so there are really different types of monitors. This is an example of a monitor re recently released uh, called Climate Trace. Um, it provides kind of um, estimate or um, uh, independent assessment of emissions, CO2 emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it says here from almost half million sources, uh, you see it's kind of like a point map, but also has polygons. So it can be also very complex information. Uh, whether you can see here looking at this world map, whether you can understand what's really happening, that's a different issue. But for sure, these are very important tools and um, and we see them more and more, there's more and more tools developing that help us uh, track uh, state of nature, environment. Uh, this is uh, also another example, C trees. Uh, I think it's uh, made by a, um, a, a startup. It runs under earth engine. Uh, it has, um, it's relatively easy to use. Uh, and it, at the moment, it only goes back to 2018, but you can see with this red, red, different shades of yellow to red, you can see the estimate of potential deforestation or the loss or loss of the uh, tree cover. Uh, and zoom in is uh, here, I zoom in on, on Brazil um, just to demonstrate. Uh, so when you look at these monitors, there's uh, different uh, types of monitors. Uh, let's say you can classify them on different uh, principles. One of the principle is the uh, target domain. So let's say uh, you have these human caused events. So you want to have a monitor where there's a human caused event like the greenhouse gas emissions or clear cutting or some uh, oil spills. Then you have uh, natural hazard events. So these events not caused by people, but also very important. So like fires, earthquakes, flood events. Um, then you have the ecosystem health monitors. Uh, so th these are usually long term. Uh, so it could be something like um, um, uh, pollution, air pollution, or it can be um, a loss of biodiversity or some succession of ecosystem or some disease, a spread of disease. Uh, then there are socioeconomic monitors. Um, and maybe there are also different categories, but you get an idea. So based on a, a target domain, you could have different types of monitor. Then also you can... Uh, you can classify monitors based on, a, let's say, urgency. So you have, like, in your extreme case, you have a real-time monitors that tells you exactly now what's happening. But this is only few, only few monitors can really afford that. That's usually most uh, complex thing, most demanding. Then you have a daily, daily to weekly updates, monthly to seasonal updates, and annual updates. Um, and in the open net monitor, uh, we focus at the moment. We focus on um annual updates monthly updates um and possibly we would like to switch to weekly updates in a couple of years uh, whether we will be able to reach uh, real time dur uh, during the duration of project i doubt it uh, but it could happen uh, you never know technology also surprises uh, we also uh, in this open net monitor most of the data set you see we build it ourselves uh, but we also take uh, data from other groups so, um, and uh, we uh, kind of try to emphasize this open, reproducible, open science uh, approach. Um, how to design an open earth monitor. There's this term open, I think you see it possibly uh, more and more uh, being used on conferences, scientific conferences in uh, programs, European Commission programs, open science, open earth monitor. So what does it, what does it mean open? It, it could mean different to different organizations and people. So to us, open uh, open is about uh, primarily about licenses, and uh, so we have these four pillars of uh, fair uh, fair science. So the first pillar is the reproducible science. So we uh, we build computational everything we do we we put in code and we write these computational notebooks. Then we share them uh, and we build these knowledge hubs. Then uh, second uh, bu building pillar of fair science is the open source software. So we use licenses like GPL, MIT, Apache, 
AGPL. Uh, then uh, for data, we use open data license, usually CC BY or CC BY share alike, or open database license. And then the last uh, building pillar is that we register the data and the metadata, and we register them uh, hopefully uh, following some standards. So they're, very, they're also interoperable. They can be also accessed through APIs. Uh, at the moment, we promote a lot of stack, uh, special temporal asset catalog, and we also use uh, Zenodo uh, to register data. Uh, I'm personally really much uh, inspired by the sharing culture, and I just put this citation by a Dutch uh, historian and a philosopher, uh, Ruth Brechman, uh, so who said, uh, you, only, you only get uh, more of the most beautiful things in the life when you share them. So that's uh, examples, trust, friendship, and peace. Uh, so um, so I'm really much inspired by Sharing Castle. That's why I started also Open Geohub. And that's why uh, when we run the Open Net Monitor, we were inspired to try to do something like that. Uh, this is one example of the paper. Also, this project delivered um, integrated global assessment of the natural forest carbon potential. Uh, and it's very interesting. Uh, one of our colleagues also on this project, uh, Tom Crowther, if you maybe heard of uh, the story behind uh, one or two publications that came out from his group, and they claim that uh, planting a trillion trees in the world could even solve the uh, uh, global warming, uh, climate change. Um, and I'm I'm really proud of Tom Crowther. He came back through that process and evolved, and um, in a way uh, become much wiser. And uh, in a recent re interview that connected with this uh, publication. He's actually emphasized that he's focusing on uh, greenwashing, killing greenwashing. Um, and uh, killing greenwashing maybe sounds a bit harsh, but uh, it is something really scary and something that we also worry. So we do want to provide open net monitors that can prevent really from greenwashing and misusing um, information um, because the uh, environment and uh, uh, global ecosystem, it's very complex. There's a really complex interaction and Sometimes very difficult to predict. You know, we still cannot predict weather for the like a one month or something. Um, so, uh, so I really, I'm really proud of Tom Crowther for becoming wiser going through this process and and picking up that greenwashing as something that uh, he wants to focus on. Uh, another thing I want to show you one of the data sets we produce. It's about 1.5 terabyte. Uh, we call it a FAPAR data set. Uh, it's a monthly uh, FAPAR global um, complete consistent. Uh, harmonized, um, and we actually have even the quantiles, the 5%, 50%, 95% .5 probability quantiles. And uh, what we did, we uh, we used it to see, uh, to quantify what's happening with the planet. FAPAR is a, a biophysical parameter, fraction absorbed um, um, photosynthesis. Uh, so it's kind of uh, quantifies the uh, primary productivity uh, so biomass productivity, you see the green areas are usually like jungles and forests, and they have a much higher FAPAR. And then the deserts, you know, they have a uh, close to zero FAPAR. And uh, so what we did, we produced this data set, and then we analyzed for every pixel in the world, and we produced this trend map. And this trend map, again, what I said, the uh, satellite images don't lie. So where you see the uh, reddish, uh, pinkish color, the, the darker pit, it means there's a negative trend and, and greener color needs a positive uh, trend. So you can see in, in the world, you have places where there is a positive increase in the FAPAR actually in the last 23 years. Uh, for example, India and China, uh, increase in FAPAR. Uh, but you have also places where there's like usually can be some uh, deforestation or, or conversion of forest into plantations. And then you can see, you can objectively see that there's a decrease in the FAPAR, and it's visible here in the plot B. Uh, that's, a, that's a place here in Brazil. You can see that there, there is a, a, the actual FAPAR, which is the red one. It uh, becomes uh, uh, smaller than the potential FAPAR, so the FAPAR on the natural vegetation. And you can see there is a gap created. And so the satellite images don't lie, as I said. And these are clearly indication of something's happening. In the open web monitor, we are the Fediverse uh, type of project. So we have decided to build things in three tiers. Uh, sometimes it's a bit confusing for people, but very simple, very in a nutshell, I want to explain it is three tiers. Uh, the tier one is this uh, a place where we're going to publish because we're a 23 partner. 
So we're going to publish the best of the best uh, data sets uh, and, um, and provide very simple uh, solutions for general public to learn about um, uh, different uh, environmental processes and dynamics. Then we have also tier two, and these are the uh, solutions developed by partners, but these solutions, uh, we are aiming at making them compatible so they can also come in the same catalog. Uh, and that's this Fediverse concept. And then we also have the tier three, which I'm going to show you on the end, uh, which is the lightweight uh, on-demand solution. So we develop also software tools, libraries to help anyone build up their own uh, visualizations. In the tier one, we have a specific design, how we made the um, uh, this monitor, so this uh, central open net monitor work. Uh, we uh, uh, focus things a lot on the geo stories. So uh, geo stories are used on the level of user. So that's uh, something self-explanatory, one click uh, animation that gets you really quickly involved. Uh, and uh, multiple geo stories are connected to different monitors. And this monitor for us in the center of our work is the actually the third part is the user communities and what we call use cases. And this is in this case, for example, um, UNCCD or FAO. And we hope that they use this uh, monitor this data for their land degradation neutrality or different uh, projects and programs. Uh, and then below that, we also have the data set are independently registered and also their research publication explaining all the uh, production steps. So every geo story comes with a research publication. And uh, and then we hope that these things uh, will uh, come to use case. They will go to these user communities and they will eventually have impact. Uh, so they will lead to some real, uh, real life applications. This is the list of things we have to produce in the project. Uh, next uh, summer, I think many things will be already out. Uh, and then by the end of this year, I think we'll have most of things out. So just to just to get an idea, and we 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 are doing separately uh, Europe and global because they're really it's a really separate uh, can be separate stories. Um, and this all these things will pop up on this uh, Earth Monitor app. Um, this Earth Monitor app, which we are presenting today, uh, it has a specific design. Uh, so just very quickly, I want to say. Uh, we insisted on having a, a storytelling, uh, and I'm talking about something very simple, like a one-click animations, like a, a you know YouTube gallery of videos or something. Um, and then uh, we uh, we are hoping to have uh, very easy to uh, very easy access, so people go one click to watch the video, uh, watch the animation, then a one click to find the data set, uh, one click to find. How the method, how was it done? You know, usually that's a peer review publication or something. Uh, and also everything will be cross-linked so people can always stay and keep on looking for things. Uh, our inspiration was something like this. Um, this is called Google Earth uh, time-lapse. Um, if you Google it, you find all this gallery of time-lapses around the world. Uh, and you see the self-explanatory. As soon as you click on something, it starts, the video starts playing. Um, and but this Google uh, Google Earth time lapse is only basically optical images. Uh, this is not by physical variables. It's not about ecology environment, but just shows you know visually what's happening. This uh, mining site in Alberta in Canada, and you can see how it grew over the last uh, 25, 30 years. You can see the expansion. Um, Okay, so now we're going to talk about the backend and front end. Um, I will pass it on now to my colleague uh, from GILAP, uh, Luca Glushica, uh, who's going to tell you about this uh, app that we're going to demo in a second. Uh, he is going to tell you what's really behind and how was it made. So please, Luca, take over. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, I'm coming from GILAP. It's a company station in Belgrade, and uh, uh, we have a multiple year, whole multitude of years in experience in geoinformatics, and we provide uh, web and mobile GIS solutions that, uh, based on remote sensing and earth observation data. Uh, it's all tailor made to uh, clients' needs and uh, their business logic. We are very involved in uh, spatial data science where. Our personnel use a comprehensive set of machine learning algorithms and geostatistics to support our software solutions. And 
to produce a real uh, value added added value uh, information. So also um, we provide data supported consulting services to help our clients uh, adopt geoinformatics and in their business logic and in life in general. So we can go on to the next slide. So uh, about Open Earth Monitor platform, more specifically backend part of the platform, uh, what you see here is a kind of flowchart of the whole workflow. Uh, the processes that we go through to publish uh, the data sets. And uh, we, for now, we store a lot of information in a spreadsheet where we have all the necessary information about monitors, geostories, and the data sets available. Uh, the important part uh, would be uh, this middleware process where we pull information from the spreadsheet, prepare the data sets using GDAL and Python uh, for publishing, and then we publish these data sets to GeoServer where we also have uh, deployed the PostgreSQL, PostGIS uh, database for performance reasons because uh, it's all about big data and uh, these mosaics can be performance-wise very, very uh, huge. And uh, so we index these mosaics uh, through a database and serve it like that. Uh, also part of the middleware process, we prepare the information that we pulled from the spreadsheet and uh, pass it on to the REST API, which was built in Flask. And through this REST API, we serve uh, several endpoints that, uh, as you can see in the end, uh, open it monitor front end part uses extensively to, to visualize and uh, uh, to show you how the platform actually works from the client side. So uh, we can move on. Uh, of course, there are a lot of things to improve. Uh, obviously we are missing a catalog and we are planning on using stack for that and uh, maybe automate the publishing of the data sets uh, process by using stack and uh, turning to more harmonized way of um, uh, storing that information. So of course we need to work on the standardizing uh, this information. For example, we need to have a certain file naming convention for the data sets. Uh, formats uh, and and so on, so that we can actually inspire people to contribute and to have a, a prepared way to to instruct them how to do so. Uh, also, we plan to extend the API with uh, some interesting features for querying datasets and also downloading subsets of these datasets. That's something that we can talk about in the future, and we certainly plan on doing so. And of course, we are making sure that. Uh, platform, the backend side of the platform uh, will be stable, scalable, and of course we plan on uh, tweaking the performance along the way. So thank you, that's pretty much it for me. Okay, thank you, Luca. Now we switch from a backend and we switch to the frontend, and the frontend has been developed by uh, Visuality, and uh, we have here Santiago Ferrer from Visuality uh, with us. So uh, Santiago, I recommend that you uh, share your screen. I will stop sharing my screen. Good. Um, so, well, uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, like Tom said, my name is Santiago uh, and uh, I am the project manager of the Visuality site for this project. And let me uh, guide you through a little bit of what we have been doing in the front end. First of all, saying that Visuality uh, has the role of uh, doing the web design and the front end development for the tier one part of the platform. So I will let you know a little bit about the infrastructure of the front end first. Uh, there is three main points uh, regarding the uh, front end infrastructure. First one is that it's based on a decoupled client from backend. Um, this has been done to increase, uh, well, to to have a better performance, reliability, and scalability. Also, this allows us to be cloud friendly and to allow a faster onboarding for anybody that wants to contribute in this project as that, as you know, is open. 
And second, uh, we are using the most popular modern and open source framework, uh, Next.js, uh, well, arguably, of course. And third, uh, we are using UI components developed with React and Tailwind CSS, which allows us for a better usability, performance, and reusable components. And it's highly customizable. So a little bit about us, about Visuality. Um, at Visuality, we are... Um, committed to creating science-based digital tools that radically empower organizations to make positive changes now. Uh, we have more than 14 years of experience working with some world-changing organizations, amongst which, well, this is a little example of some of the uh, most known that we have worked with, Google, NASA, ESA, WRI, WWF, the IDB, and uh, a number of organizations worldwide, from NGOs to uh, governmental institutions to corporate businesses. So uh, pretty much our purpose is uh, we are informed by science, inspired by nature, and we deliver with impact, empowering people with data, insights, and compassionate uh, communication that's perfectly tailored to their needs. We use data and human understanding to develop the products, services, and strategies of the future. And here, just a couple of uh, examples uh, on the field of restoration. Uh, for instance, Forest Forward is one of the portals and platforms that we have worked for um, in association with WRI, in the, with WWF in this case. On the forestation, uh, Global Forest Watch is one of the most known feature um, tools that we have done in collaboration with WRI in this case. And then a clim and on climate change, we have done Climate Watch in collaboration with a huge uh, consortium of partners, including WRI and other known uh, partners. And for climate risks and planning, uh, we have done the Partnership for Resilience and Preparedness, uh, also um, um, being a visuality part of this uh, big consortium of a variety of partners. Uh, focusing on the Open Earth Monitor, uh, what is currently available uh, in the app for the end user and the user interface? Well, basically, we could say that there's two main pieces. The landing page that acts as a hub or as a catalog, if you want, to explore the content, uh, including some functionalities like searching, filtering, and sorting, some of them still a work in progress. And the other big part of the platform would be the map page, where we will allow geospatial representation of the data included in the monitors of geosto and geostories. Basically, the geostories um, allow users to seamlessly visualize and experience spatial and temporal trends, events, and effects of scenario testing. And like Tom was saying before, uh, they allow for one-click access to all the information, and they are directed to all types of users, regardless of their knowledge of GIS and, and science uh, topics. And then we have the monitors, which is a broader concept, okay, on which uh, users can explore the data included in those monitors freely. And this is directed uh, to users with some expertise and GIS knowledge. Um, I'm going to do a quick um, demo of the app. So we will start by the hub, as I was saying before. When you land on the app, uh, you will see the hub. You can see on the header that we will have access to other sections of the tool, to the, to the map, and also access to the data catalogs and the Open Earth Monitor Cyber Infrastructure project site. So when we, after the welcome message, uh, we can uh, scroll down to start uh, browsing the content. Uh, the content is presented in the, in, the, in the shape of cards where most of the basic information will be presented uh, at first sight and then users will have the chance to dig deeper. You can see that uh, we have a functionality for searching the content, which is still a work in progress. Um, we can also filter the content by categories, which for this project, we are considering six basic themes. Okay, so when we um, click on each of the categories, we can see the content related to that. As you can see, it's color coded to differentiate the different categories using colors and an icon to distinguish them. So agriculture, we have water. We also have biodiversity, soils, climate and health, and last but not least, forest related content. So let's unfilter to see everything. You can also have the possibility to only see monitors or only seeing geo stories. And in any case, everything is uh, very um, pretty cross-linked. 
Okay, from the geo stories, as you can see, you can also access directly the monitor. And when we enter the monitors, we will be able to see information in general of the monitor. We will be able to know also what which partner of this consortium has been in charge of the monitor. And there will be a way to access the website of that partner on a separated tab. Okay. Um, then in case there are any linked publications, they will be shown here. And there will be a link to the use cases defined at the project's uh, level to which the monitor uh, relates. And this will take us to the project website where the different use cases are displayed. From this um, screen to know more about the monitor, we can launch the monitor directly, but I will go there in a second as I first want to show you how this information is presented in the case of GeoStories. You see the same color coding to differentiate the different themes that the GeoStories belong to. So for instance, if we are at the urbanization trends in GeoStory, when we click on know more, we will have also the description of the GeoStory, all the information related to the authors, access to the computational notebooks that can be accessed directly at the source of these computational notebooks. We will also have access to the metadata of the, of the GeoStory, which will take us in this case to the stack um, uh, account of uh, where the where the data is hosted. And then we will have links to the publications, as Tom was saying before. All the data that we are producing in this project is supported by peer-reviewed publica scientific publications. And again, the link to the use cases. Also, from this window, we can already launch the GeoStory directly, and this will take us to the map. Again, I will hold you for a couple of seconds more so that I can show you that all this information as we will be finding a lot of content and especially uh, within a couple of months, uh, sorry, within a few months, we will find more. It's all paginated to facilitate the access more um, organized. And then last but not least, uh, we have in the bottom of the page, all the information related to the project uh, and links to the social media accounts where the project uh, has um, presence. Okay, and we can have obviously the information stating that the that the European uh, Union is um, um, funding this project, and also well general information like disclaimers, privacy policy, which will take us to the project's website, and a way to contact us that will also take us to the project's website. So let's go into the visualization directly. As we were saying, the let's say the main character of this uh, story are the geo stories, which provide, uh, like we were saying before, a seamless way to visualize trends for the general uh, users, the common citizen, to understand what's behind this data without having that deep knowledge on science or GIS. So from here, we can just directly access the geo story and this will take us to the map. Okay, so in this case, this geo story, it's about losses and gains in primary productivity as um, seen from the FAPAR um, based monthly trends and the FAPAR um, based, uh, sorry, uh, average. Okay, so in the FAPAR based monthly trends, we have a time series that, as you can see, is directly playing, giving the user already um, um, a sensation of what that trend is. And then we can compare it easily with this compare functionality with the average during all these years. We can stop it at any time and select any specific year or any specific time spot. In this case, it's monthly. So we can go to the time spot that we want and we can easily compare. Another thing that we can do, it's from the map, we can also navigate from the different monitors and geo stories. In the map, to facilitate the, the navigation, we are only displaying those monitors and user stories that, that geo stories that already are um, configured and for which we already have information. So we were, okay, yeah. If I go to the world land degradation monitor, which is the one of which the FAPAR based monthly trends be belongs to, another option that we have once we are showing one of the layers, what we can do is we can compare two different time moments, so different moments in time, sorry. So for instance, comparing the first and the last one, we can get a pretty good idea of how it has um, evolved in the last 21 years in this case. And if we go to, I would say that it's the 
highlight of the of the geo stories we have at this moment urbanization trends based on uh, nightlight images in this case uh, same we can see on the left already in autoplay the time series of nightlight images and on the right the average so we can compare the evolution of uh, nightlight images with the average of the last 20 something years we can also stop at any moment and uh, continue comparing. As you can see uh, here on the on the map, we also have all the information related to the geo story with the description, author, access to computational notebooks, use cases, and publications. Pretty much like we were like we were seeing from the hub. So in the end, uh, it's made for users to be able to access everything just with one click. And regardless if they're on the hub or on the map, they will have access pretty much to the same information, depending on their level of knowledge and their characteristics as users. And from here as well, as you can see, we have a common header so that they can go to the data catalogs and also to the project site. So this is pretty much the need, the, yeah, the overview of uh, what the platform can do now. And it will keep growing in the following months as we get more data from the rest of the partners and more defined geo stories. And uh, Santiago, maybe you could tell something about the book bookmarking system used in the uh, up Earth Monitor. Absolutely, and sorry about that. <laughs> but yes, uh, well, besides obvious functionalities in any GIS tool like zooming in and out and navigating to different parts of the world, uh, the users have the chance to bookmark the visualizations they are visualizing at that moment on a very simple way. They can just like save it so they can come back to these visualizations. Okay, if I at some point I just go to any other geo story, for instance, this one, if I would like to see what I was doing before, I just need to go to my bookmarks. I just click on visualization one and then the data will load and I will be able to go back to the uh, urbanization. Sorry about data taking a little bit to load, We're still in an alpha version, but now it will take us to the geo story we were, we were watching before. And pretty much in the same way, we have a way to share this with uh, other users just by copying the URL link and sending it with our a tool of choice for messaging or whatever. And then we also have a way to share it directly on our um, social media accounts in case we have one of those. So um, this is pretty much the overview of what we can do already with the, with the platform in still this alpha version. And then I'll pass it to you, Tom. Thank you, Santiago. Let me you try have to, to stop sharing screen. I know I'm <laughs> okay. There we go. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's fantastic uh, to see uh, everything now integrated. And just to tell everyone, it's been uh, over six months of uh, work and meetings uh, with you guys, uh, most of the time uh, meeting virtually. But uh, I'm very happy to see things now up and running. Um, I just want to conclude this uh, with a, some, some summary points and we'll open the floor for your questions. So what you saw, it's a, a kind of a platform or, 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 or publishing platform uh, for data sets and geo stories. Um, and um, it will be extended. It will grow to hundreds of stories. Um, and we do believe that every citizen has a right to know what's happening with the planet. And we do believe that... Uh, Earth observation technology is the really the key technology to objectively monitor our environment. Um, and uh, you can see that you can track things um, through time. Uh, you can uh, provide real-time, daily, monthly, annual views. Um, and if we do that, eventually people will recognize, they will connect with that. And we do recognize some positive negative trends which are hidden in Earth observation data. But we are able, in this project, we are able to really zoom in and uh, compute this uh, using computational notebooks that they can be reproduced and then sharing that through GitHub and GitLab. Uh, so we're very happy about that. Uh, this is a Fediverse type of project. Uh, so we have also tier two solution. There's a lot of, a lot of ways you can visualize uh, same data in, and we really support it. 
we support this diversity uh, as long as there is a fair science to the computational notebooks and people can really track back what happened. We also support uh, peer review publications. We support that uh, people uh, defend their methods and uh, approaches. They defend them with independent independent assessment by the third uh, third um, groups of researchers. Uh, and we hope that this will be a basis to support uh, the green transition, especially in Europe, but also globally, and also to to help kickstart new businesses in the years to come. The tier three, which we didn't have time to talk, uh, we also developing intensively that you can also install some software uh, and then build up your own uh, monitor or visualization with your own data. Uh, this is just an example with the G3W suite, which runs on QGIS really. And uh, we developed actually here, our project developed a plugin uh, to visualize uh, uh, time series data. Uh, so what you see here is a, a one, la uh, one layer for Europe uh, visualizing space and time. So we are also developing a third party solution that eventually you should be able in one day uh, to load your data and develop it. Our partner on the project, uh, Brockman Consult, they're also busy with the XQ viewer, also open source base. You can put the time series data. It's suitable for um, large data uh, and it works uh, with ZAR. As our uh, files. Um, and uh, this is more or less it. Uh, we are open now to uh, uh, get some questions. We have about 10 minutes, I think. Uh, so we timed our presentation, so we have some time to uh, answer your questions. I just want to take one more time, special visuality and GILAB for working really hard on getting this uh, front end and back end connected and working. Um, and it's uh, alpha, it's alpha release. so. There are issues uh, we will uh, adding, keep, keep on adding things. And we are also open to uh, publishing your work. So if you have some data sets, uh, something really compatible with principles of open at monitor, please contact me, send me an email. And uh, it is we are open to hosting also third party data set provided they're not petabytes in size. Uh, so we can also uh, include them in this uh, app. And with this thing, I open the floor for questions. So please, if there's any questions uh, from the public, uh, Tian Yu, uh, I don't know if you collected something on the chat or if somebody wants to raise a hand, uh, now it's your time to ask. Maybe I can start with a, with a question to, uh, uh, to Gilab team. So you mentioned there's this API you developed. Are there specifications of F a API, they're already available somewhere. Um, could somebody build up a interface uh, just using API, possibly? Luca? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, it's a Flask API. We also have a document documented everything we worked on. So yeah, it, the plan is to be, of course, to serve it as serve it to the public, so it will be open as well. Right now, Visuality team is using that for uh, getting around uh, functionalities. But of course, uh, there is a Swagia documentation about everything we worked on. And I, I should also mention, we do have a, a GitHub uh, page where you can uh, see all the um, software projects and also data projects. Um, and also this uh, front end will be will pop up here somewhere, I think, if, if it's not already. And also the API documentation will pop up here. That's certainly yes. the plan. Uh, yes, Tom, we have yes. questions. Okay. Yeah, uh, it would be nice if we could overlay our own spatial data on top of this WebG system. It's from uh, uh, Dragos. Uh, Dragos, do you want to speak uh, more detailedly? Yes, I understand the question, but uh, it's really for Luca. How could somebody, um, I mean, if we talk like a geo package or a, a cog that is uh, on some S3, will that be maybe possibility? Hello, hello. Uh, I think yeah. geo package, geo pack is the solution to make these overlays. Okay. 
Uh, maybe Luca, you want to uh, respond to that? If somebody has like a call on some S3 URL. Yeah, uh, well, it depends uh, what take? kind of uh, visual information you want to get. But in terms of uh, background, we, we are in the process of, um, as we as I mentioned uh, during the presentation, moving to Stack and uh, creating uh, instructions on how to contribute. Uh, of course, uh, if someone has something to offer, uh, there is a possibility, of course, to publish the data set to the GS server. And now it's up to visuality team on how to incorporate that into the front end application and how to make it uh, visible, of course, uh, if you're speaking about overlaying existing data sets, that's a question for them because uh, the visualization okay. is there. So, let's say that comes as a wish list item to uh, uh, allow people to import their data and just drag it. Yeah, yes, okay. So, let's let's write it down as a wish list item. We can easily serve that information through API because. Nothing changes on our end, but on their end, it's up to them. But okay, be... let's see if there's another question, maybe. Yes, we received Monica's uh, question where there be an option to subset and download data. Uh, okay. Monica, I can give you the uh, if you'd like to uh, give some more. Well, I can maybe, I'm still screen sharing, right? Yes, you are screen, you are still screen so, sharing. So we are developing uh, code examples, at least for R, uh, how to do, um, how to connect to the stack and then to do a query all the layers and also do spatial overlay. So uh, you pick up some layer and then you say, I just want to overlay. You can do it in parallel, so it will give you the values. And you can also do cropping. Uh, we, we just started writing this tutorial, but uh, we're going to provide information, especially for developers in Python, in R, possibly in Julia, uh, how to do this um, virtual, so access this uh, um, cogs and then do crop crop layers and do space time, spatial, spatial temporal overlay and do things. I also to add that um, REST API will also have that functionality okay. uh, based on geometry provided to download the subset of the data that's uh, available. We don't have so. yet documentation for the uh, Earth Monitor app API. But it's it's coming, so we're going to. So that's another thing I think priority I see uh, to have that uh, published, so uh, users can build their queries and uh, access data. Uh, more questions, Tian Yu? Uh, yeah, uh, there's a question from James that uh, how can I receive the training on how to use these tools? Okay, that's a that's an excellent. A question, and um, if you saw my uh, slides, I did mention that we have this uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and for example, um, for many of these data sets we do, uh, there is also a workshop. Uh, so you can watch these videos here. Uh, some of the videos uh, are a bit longer. They can be like uh, one hour or something. You see one hour, 20 minutes. So that's something I did on the open land map. And, uh, and here is also on uh, how to use uh, COGS and how to uh, access this data. So, so there's a lot of tutorials online and uh, you just have to follow the links on our project page. There is a section called um, Knowledge Hub. So if you go to Knowledge Hub, you can uh, access all these videos. They're all listed here. And then you should be able to find um, explanation. More questions, Tianyu? Uh, do we have more questions? Uh, you can either uh, raise hands or type in your questions. Uh, is there any more questions popping up? No. Uh, otherwise, we can uh, we can slowly uh, close the session. Uh, yeah. Yes, there's oh, one we have, Yeah, we have one. 
Okay. Uh, what is the long-term strategy for keeping the platform funded after the EU project ends? Yes, that's a good uh, that's a good point. Uh, uh, often with uh, uh, often with uh, um, the non for profit, like we open job is a non for profit foundation, so we, we don't have interest in building like a commercial solution. Not not, not, not as a primary thing. Uh, so uh, often the question is, you know, what what if project runs out, this project will run out in 2026, uh, 20, uh, 27. So it's going to run out. Uh, so what happens then? Um, so um, so we we build up this as a open development communities because we know that many projects that are open source, they did survive. Uh, if, the, if the project is good, then it does survive. So if, if it produces useful things and people find it important, then people continue maintaining it. So for the code, we don't worry. The code will, uh, uh, some of these things, like for example, the Zen library, we feel like it's going to continue uh, because it's such a high interest. There will be maybe thousands of users of this. So we think some of the software is going to survive. The data set uh, will hopefully be hosted uh, slowly in the uh, Copernicus um, uh, data space ecosystem. Uh, so it will be hosted and so which is basically paid by European Commission and European Space Agency. So the data will also be preserved forever. Uh, the uh, the computational notebooks, they can stay on GitHub. So that's also free hosting. So so what I'm trying to say, there's many things that you don't have really high cost. You know, it's just about uh, keeping it tidy and uh, having it registered some on some uh, permanent repository. So many things are really low cost. Uh, the uh, having just the app, you know, just the front end, as long as the data is distributed and hosted on different places, also it's a very low cost. There's no, there's no really, there's no really cost. So we have in a in our philosophy that we are looking for uh, sustainability uh, by um, basically three principles. For us, sustainability is a uh, productive, open, developing communities where people even on a voluntary basis do things. So like in a Wikipedia approach, then the second thing is the cutting down the hosting cost. Uh, so cutting down the hosting cost means um, publishing data on repositories, massive repositories by organizations that have massive budgets. And then the third thing is the Fediverse approach, Fediverse approach, having distributed data, uh, having also solutions distributed uh, so that the uh, the groups can distribute also the 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 work and the the possibly local computing cost etc because there's also computing cost involved so these are the three principles however in our project we also have a commercial parties uh, we have a gilab is a commercial visualities commercial party uh, we have brockman consult we have synergize uh, now uh, planet so we have also commercial parties. We also support them to take some of these ideas and to scale them up, to make them more ambitious um, and to make them into uh, some business cases that uh, also become uh, self-sustained with uh, happy customers and with uh, applications that help this green transition. So we support both ways, uh, non-for-profit and for-profit uh, evolution and I think with that diversity I'm confident that we will survive not everything will survive but I'm confident that many like uh, this package I show you is an order uh, Zen sorry uh, I, I'm confident many things will survive many data sets of course publication stays forever uh, computational github is uh, hopefully also will stay forever so I think many things will survive but it's a very good question so thanks whoever asked that question so very good question If there's no more questions, uh, Tianyu? Uh, no more questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for connecting. Um, it's, uh, um, the app has uh, been launched. It's very simple. The URL, you'll, you'll memorize it, app.earthmonitor.org. Uh, keep in touch. Uh, register for our newsletter. Uh, register for our social uh, channels. You can find them all on the, on the front page. Uh, so uh, register for... Open at Monitor, there is also a, a workshop uh, that will be hosted next uh, October, September, October, 
at uh, Yasa in uh, Austria, uh, close to Vienna. Uh, so please come to a global workshop, uh, at a truly open workshop. So we video record things in high quality. We use uh, voting tools and uh, democracy tools to get feedback, uh, Slido, Mattermost, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and we publish reports also publicly uh, from the meeting. So please come to our workshop. You can also choose to stay two days extra uh, to have get training in using uh, data cubes, uh, doing data modeling, et cetera. Uh, so you're most welcome to come. So please register this and come to our events uh, and uh, otherwise register for our newsletter um, so you can receive every month a notice about new data sets, et cetera. Thank you so much and uh, all the best with your work. And we see each other, if not in literature, then on some conference or virtually on some web webinar or science uh, uh, science meeting. Bye-bye. Thank you Thank also you everyone. Bye. and Gilab for preparing everything and for presenting. Thank you. Bye.